Good evening to you all. This is Broadcasting ADHD Europe. I'm Hans van der Velde. In daily life, I work as a coach. I coach employees for employers. Next to that, I'm a member of the board of ADHD Europe. And today we're going to talk about ADHD and sleep with our guest, Sandra Koy. But first, be before we proceed, I want to give the word to Vilja Wilding, our uh, technical assistant and webmaster. Vilja. Hello, I'm the operations officer of ADHD Europe. I do lots of the behind the scenes stuff and making these events happen. While Hans is the brains, I provide the technology. Um, we've got uh, my latest count, which I will now get for you, Hans. We have got 1,551 registrants, which is massive because about 10 minutes ago when I checked that, we were only about 1,400. So 100 of you have registered in the past about 10 minutes, and we've already got 250 people now live. Before I let Hans and Sandra go into their thing, um, you know, if you if you appreciate these webinars, if e every single person that was to register donates one euro, it will make it a lot easier for us to increase our technology budget, do lots more things and get more interesting speakers like Sandra, who are very busy and give us their time for free to come on board. So I'm going to put a donate link down in the comments. If any of you want to donate, please feel free. And with that, I'll give Hans and Sandra the floor. Yeah. Thank you, Filio, for this update. Um, just to be clear, we are planning to go on till about nine o'clock, so it'll last one hour. If it takes a little bit longer, that's not a problem. Um, and then ADHD Europe is very proud to have Professor Sandra Coy here to inform us about ADHD, sleep and health, and the connection between the three. Uh, Sandra Coy is uh, one of our advisory board members, and she is professor in the Amsterdam University. But Sandra, I invite you to introduce yourself a little bit more, please. Okay, can I have my first slide, Vilja, please? I'm Sandra Coy. I'm, as Hans already mentioned, I'm uh, a professor of on adult ADHD in Amsterdam at the Free University, uh, Amsterdam University Medical Center, and I work as a psychiatrist and researcher at PsyQ in The Hague. Next, please. I'm so happy to introduce you into the new knowledge that we gained the last 10 years by doing research and uh, getting more experience in clinical practice, treating ADHD, but not only ADHD, also sleep and how they interact and what we can learn from that. I have no conflict of interest. Next, please. Yeah, you get now first some questions for you because we want to know what kind of audience we're talking to. And the first one is coming up now. By Filio. The question is, do you have sleep problems? And you can answer yes or no. And where should they answer, Filio, in the chat? They should answer with the link in the chat. It's a little straw poll. You can just go ahead, click there, I put it on Facebook and on YouTube, and the answers will come in, which I will now display. Okay. Uh, can people find a link? Yep. Okay, wonderful. I don't see it. And if you have answered that one, the next questions are... Can I think, show? can we can we give people a minute to just answer it first? Okay. We've got 78 votes in so far, 95. Yeah. 106. I will quickly display that for you before yeah. we move back. So, 138 of you voted, 94 do, 44 don't. Okay. And I, I have no doubt people will continue filling that in. Mm -hmm. First, we'll go to your next poll. Okay. We can all see already see that the majority, around 70%, uh, mentions to have sleep problems. So that's the very reason that you're attending, I suppose. So we're in good company. And the next question is, if you have sleep problems, which one applies to you? Is it difficulty falling asleep on time or having a late sleep phase? Uh, are you hyper aroused at night? Can you, can you, you can't stop the motor 
and this is called insomnia. Do you suffer from restless legs at night or during sleep? Do you have sleep apnea or other? And we allow for multiple problems because we know in ADHD, um, sleep problems are highly prevalent and some people have more than one. So please go ahead. I'm going to switch my screen. Mm -hmm. Maybe explain again where people can find it. Uh... That's in the chat. You've got a little StreamYard link. Sorry, not StreamYard, straw poll link. Too many technologies, not enough time. Yeah, it's quite recognizable. Uh, the division of the percentages but it will it will continue it's only 112 30 people now 560 odd people online by the way hello everybody mm -hmm. Maybe we should continue and, sure. and, get, and get back to these outcomes um, in maybe five minutes so that we don't lose time. What do you think? Yeah, that's absolutely. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Can we have next slide, please? Okay. I'll start talking to you about timing. Sleep needs to be timed and daily activity is timed as well. And timing is so very, very important. Uh, can you click, Phil, you please? Yep. And living out of phase, being late or being irregular in your sleep pattern, it means that you're continuously jet lagged. And this is not only that your sleep is out of phase, but also your body temperature, your blood pressure, your melatonin secretion, your bowel movements in the morning after breakfast, your highest alertness phase, are all timed processes. Same is true for hormonal release, for coordination and, and muscle power, uh, for muscle strength. So every process in the body is being directed by the biological clock in our brain. That's, that's in fact the, the, the director of sleep patterns, but also of all organs being orchestrated in the same rhythm. And when, the, when we're not in the same rhythm with our organs, we're jet lagged. We all know the feeling of jet lag when we come back from the United States and we lack six hours of sleep or even worse when we come back from the East. Um, and then our complete body is out of sync and we feel tired during daytime, but we also are hungry at night or we need to go to the toilet at a strange time that we're not used to. This means that all the organs are out of sync and this is an experience we all have have. We all know, but people with ADHD experience this on a regular basis is my idea. And I'll talk you through it. Next, please. Because ADHD people, children and adults have an 80% one or more sleep problems. 80% sleeps too late and cannot sleep easily at an earlier time. This is called the delayed sleep phase. This is uh, starting in childhood. It's a harassable pattern. It lasts your whole life. So you're either a night owl or an early bird or a type that's in between. But this is, this is part of your being, how you're, how you're, um, how you're born. This leads to so-called social jet lag. You need to go to school, to work, or you have to make to get up for your children. And this is usually at a fixed time. And whether you went to bed at 11 p.m. or 3 a.m., you have to get up. And this usually leads to a sleep debt. And the sleep debt means that you have in ADHD a maximum duration of sleep five to six hours on a regular basis, whereas optimal sleep duration in an adult should be between seven and eight hours. So this is not a one night sleep debt, but a regular on a regular basis, sleep debt. What's the consequence of, sh of short sleep? Well, of course, you're sleepy during daytime, you're less focused, your cognition is lower in functioning, your memory is impaired, your mood may be, may be irritable and sad, 
and you start bitch eating. These are acute symptoms of sleep debt the next morning. And when you see this list of the consequences of short sleep, you also recognize some very ADHD typical for ADHD symptoms. Next, please. So what do we know from the literature and from our own studies? ADHD symptoms in the population are associated with sleep apnea, obstructive sleep apnea syndrome in 30%, restless legs in about 30 to 40%, periodic limb movement disorder, which is similar to restless legs, but, but during the night, so when you're asleep, insomnia with difficulties in initiating sleep and maintaining sleep, 43%. The late type, however, the late sleep type is 78%, so this is where the 80% comes from. And uresis uh, is, a, is less prevalent, but it's also happening more often in children, but also still in adults with ADHD. Bruxism more often in ADHD and nightmares are also increased in ADHD. So it's almost every sleep disorder that we see more often in ADHD and the most frequently we see uh, above. Next, please. We checked this again in our sleep, in our ADHD clinic, I would say. Uh, we asked for 490 people to fill in our questionnaire, the Holland Sleep Disorder Questionnaire, and we got a response of 81%, and 71% of them, 71 of them screened positive on one or more sleep disorder, and here are the numbers. Insomnia, 48 parasomnia, 15%, circadian rhythm or late sleep phase disorders, 60% is the highest. There were also people um, sleeping too much. This is hypersomnia, but this is a minority. Restless legs, PLND 43, and sleep apnea 19%. We will publish this hopefully later this year. So these numbers are very similar to what we found uh, in, on the population level, but this was a clinical sample. Thank you. Next one. It's important to distinguish which disorder is prevalent because every disorder has a specific treatment. And if you give the wrong treatment or general sleep hygiene treatment to any of these disorders, it won't be sufficient. So I'll talk you quickly through. Late sleep needs chronotherapy. That means sleep hygiene, melatonin and or light. Insomnia, hyperarousal, ruminating at, at night, not being able to fall asleep needs cognitive behavior therapy for insomnia. It's proven effective. Some people have both and then you need both. Restless legs needs ferritin suppletion when it's low, your, your ferritin levels may be low, and pregabalin medication helps, helps good, so it's very effective. Sleep apnea um, is, um, is beneficial, is weight loss because it's associated with overweight mandibular devices and continuous positive airway pressure to, to the reduce the sleep apnea that leads to sleepy, sleeplessness, sleep loss during the night. Next, please. So what's, what's going on with ADHD and sleep? What's first? Is it ADHD first that causes the sleep problems next? Ilio? Yeah. Or is it the other way around? The sleep problems cause ADHD symptoms during daytime? Or do they both interact and have a reciprocal causation? Or do they share an underlying etiology? Because almost all ADHD people do have sleep problems, at least 80%, and some have several sleep problems. So why is this prevalence so high and higher than in the normal population is ever seen? Do they share an underlying etiology is our question. Next, please. I'll talk you through the delayed sleep phase syndrome or late sleep phase type. It's, we call it a late chronotype. It means that your time, the type, uh, the timing of your, of your personality is late, your night owl from birth. It's a chronic pattern of very late sleep and late rise. It results in daytime sleepiness or difficulty falling asleep on time. And you may compensate for sleep loss by an irregular sleep pattern, going to bed at 10 p.m. and then at 3 a.m. and then at 5 a.m. and then again at 7 p.m. or whatever. So there is no regularity left. And this leads to dysfunctioning due to increased inattentiveness and social problems during daytime. Next. 
So here we have um, in the blue circles the chronotype or the genetic makeup that you're born with that, that set the circadian rhythm, but also the time of light onset every morning. So when it's at seven o'clock, melatonin stops. Your sleep hormone stops by the timing of the light that enters your eye and visits uh, uh, the clock, the biological clock in the brain. And when melatonin stops, dopamine is starting. And dopamine is the neurotransmitter involved in ADHD, and it's only produced during daytime. So you could argue that dopamine and melatonin are each other's um, are anti poles. What do we call it? They 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 um, they're never at the same time available. Melatonin is a night hormone. Dopamine is a daytime hormone. You could say. When it's getting dark, melatonin starts and dopamine stops. So both are needed to to synchronize your uh, genetic makeup with the the timing of light and dark of the world around you. And this is done by the eye. The eye is is the is a part of the brain that lets light enter the brain. It's the only part of the brain that has this capacity. And in the eye, there are receptors, it's a retina, for melatonin, dopamine, and melanopsin. It's not for nothing that it's these compounds, again, that tell the clock, actually, based on the light intensity, what time it is. And that's how our body, our brain, our organs know what they should do on what time. This is all programmed. So we see here... Uh, to the left, the sunlight enters the brain through the eye, talks to the clock, uh, and then you get um, you get synchronized and you get more energy, a better mood, and a better night, a better sleep at night. Can I have the next, please? Next. So the questions are: Is ADHD in fact a sleep disorder? And do we see in ADHD behavior a daytime problem? and in the late sleep, the nighttime problem? And is it both one rhythm that we're, that we're looking at? Is ADHD thus a disorder of the clock? And more importantly, could ADHD improve by treating this disturbed rhythm and or the other sleep disorders? Next, please. So this I already mentioned is ADHD a disorder of the circadian rhythm, so the, the rhythm of day and night. Here to the left you see that melatonin rises when it's dark. So you see uh, the increased level of melatonin in the upper graph and you see dopamine is low at night. And so they, they have an opposite function. We know in ADHD dopamine is dysregulated and we know that melatonin is one and a half hour delayed in its onset. We measured it in saliva 10 years ago in people with ADHD and compared it to control data. So one, and, one hour and a half later onset of melatonin is associated with later onset of sleep that we see in 80% of ADHD people. Next, please. Now, what can we... What can we further say about it? It's important to have a high contrast between day and night. So it should be quite quite dark at night. It should be bright light at daytime. And what we see here to the, to the right is a picture of a woman looking at her mobile phone and so looking into the light at night, which means that she makes it daytime for the brain by using light at night close to the eyes, close to the clock, telling the clock wrongly that it may be daytime. And this lady below wears sunglasses, which is something that many people with ADHD do as well. So they make it dark for the brain during daytime. So these are exactly the, the wrong behaviors to compensate for sleep loss, oversensitivity to light, which is the cause, the reason why people wear sunglasses so often during daytime. But the effect is that you diminish the contrast between day and night. And, and there are two questions body, about that. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, one is that the, the, isn't it the most practical for everybody to start to create darkness in the evening and open the curtains in the morning, let's say. So let in as much as possible. Uh, now it's winter, so at least in the Netherlands, it's, it's, it's not so light in the morning when you get up. But open the curtains and 
dim yeah. the lights in the night is that uh, sure sure that everybody would be can start, start. Right? that's what we call sleep hygiene so so do the do the right thing open yeah. up the curtains but better is go outside because inside the home the, the light intensity is usually not high enough to really wake up the brain so you should go outside and walk the dog for half an hour which is appropriate for yeah. waking you up or yeah. use light therapy in winter when there is no light and we'll yeah, talk about that later yeah, that, that will come later yeah. yeah and the other question is because this uh, woman with the sunglasses triggered a question there are people who are, uh, with ADHD who are very sensitive to uh, daylight outside. Yes. One of the things I have heard about is that if you use alcohol, uh, you will be more disturbed by daylight during the day. But do you know anything about that, this sensitive for light? Yeah. We, um, we, I found that many people in my office, even on clouded days and even in wintertime, wore sunglasses. And when I asked them why they did that, they said, I'm oversensitive to light. And then I said, which light? It's dark, it's cloudy, it's it's terrible weather, it's Dutch weather. <laughs> what are you yeah. talking about? And yeah. then they say, well, uh, that may be true for others, but my, my eyes are oversensitive to light. So then we started a questionnaire asking uh, people with ADHD online whether they were oversensitive to light and whether it could be explained by migraine or other disorders yeah. that also come with oversensitivity. And when controlling for those disorders, we found that 70% of people with ADHD uh, reported oversensitivity to light. And huh. this made us ask a new question. What's going on in the eye with the yeah. pupillary response to light? Because that determines your sensitivity. And this is the, the eye study we're performing now, looking into the eye of ADHD. And uh, we are now starting to finish this study and uh, start to analyze the data, but we will publish uh, later, I hope. Fantastic. So it's a very good question. And it's something that, that I uh, stumbled into clinical practice when I saw my patients entering the, the room in, in cloudy days with sunglasses. Uh -huh. That's where it started. Next, please. I'll tell you now what this picture means. Here we see to the left the United States of America and the blue colors indicate the prevalence of AHD and you see the light blue colors indicate Mexico and there the prevalence of ADHD is lowest compared to the east side of the United States. And then the graph, the graph, the picture on the right shows the same country, but now the light intensity. And here we see that light intensity is highest in Mexico where the prevalence of ADSD is lowest. And what has light intensity to do with the prevalence of ADHD? Well, that's a very good question that Martin Arndt tried to answer. And he, he argued that whether, when there's a, a big contrast between day and night, as it is in Mexico more than in New York, so you have very bright days and very dark nights without artificial lighting usually, uh, you get lower prevalence of ADHD. Why is that? Probably because they sleep better in Mexico. And that's because of the contrast between day and night. And now you start to understand that this has impact even on the prevalence rate in the population. Because when you sleep better, your ADHD severity will be reduced. And so you may not even uh, meet the criteria for the disorder when you have lower levels of symptoms. So this means that if this is true, we should be able to improve ADHD by improving sleep. And that's what we're studying also. Next, please. Yeah, this, pic this picture is from 10 years ago by Maike van Veen, my colleague from the Netherlands. And here we measured the uh, movement patterns during day and night. So the low curve is the nighttime and the high curve is daytime movements. You see two curves. And the one that is shifted to the right, the darkest one, is the people with ADHD that have difficulty falling asleep on time, sleep onset insomnia. These are the people with what we later call the delayed sleep phase. And not only their melatonin was one hour and a half delayed, also their movement pattern was one hour and a half later than controls. And this was different between ADHD and ADD people. ADD people slept longer and earlier, were still tired, and ADHD people, the 
huge majority of 94% of them had a late sleep pattern and they slept short and they were hyperactive during daytime. So this led us to the hypothesis that hyperactivity might be a coping for sleepiness in people with the combined type of ADHD. Because the ADD people are not hyperactive, that's the difference between them, but they sleep maybe 11 hours and they're still tired. They also have a sleep problem, but it's not short sleep, it's long sleep. And both are dysregulated sleep patterns. We measured this with the active watch. This is this kind of watch that you see on the right. And there below there, you see the blue bar indicating nighttime. And you see this person has not a regular rhythm. It might be an ADHD person because it's shifting to the right and to the left. It's not uh, a fixed sleep onset time. Next, please. So now I come to the jet lag story. ADHD is jet lag out of sync because when we start up above, there's not only a late melatonin onset, that's one hour and a half later, there's a resulting late sleep. And there's also a late breakfast or no breakfast because the appetite is not awake at eight in the morning. There is a late temperature profile that we studied in the next study that shows a similar pattern of a rise and fall of temperature during the 24 hour cycle um, of day and night that's that's very similar to the late movement pattern and to the late melatonin pattern. So um, what else is delayed was our next question. Next please. I'll show you this picture out of Dutch out of the Dutch journal in 2017 because the Nobel Prize for Medicine went to three researchers that found some genes that um, that dictate whether you are late or an early bird, they dictate, they found the chronobiology, the circadian biology, they found in the genes. And so we are now better able to determine what's, what's going on in the genes that make us such an early or late person. And th that the Nobel Prize for Medicine went to those researchers for genes of chronotype. Well, why is that important? Well, because the timing of sleep and all organs functioning is essential to health. And did we already prove an overlap between ADHD genes and biological late sleeper genes, whatever they call it? Yeah, we, we did find it um, in, in, in some samples, but not that it's an um, outstanding gene in the GWAS studies. Uh. But maybe this will come when the samples are larger because uh, genes yeah. often have tiny effects to be found among all effects, which is huge. Uh, it's very yeah. complex, but this is still to be found out. Uh -huh. Next, please. When you sleep late, you usually also develop winter depression. Why? Winter depression occurs when there is low light in winter, when there's late onset of light in the morning, and your mood may suffer when there is little light. Your sleep is delayed because it's not getting early light in the morning, and this leads to mood disturbance. So you can treat both by resetting the clock using timed light therapy in the morning. I say timed, so not at 11 a.m., but between 7 and 8 a.m. every morning for three weeks. This will really solve the late sleep pattern, but also the, the winter mood problem. Next. This is a proven effective therapy. Now, about late sleep and health. As I told, uh, the majority of children and adults with ADHD have a late melatonin onset. We measured it in saliva, and also other people measured it in children. When you sleep late, you, sh you usually sleep short, only five to six hours, because you have to get up for school or work. This short sleep induces increased appetite the next morning, not in the morning, but in the afternoon, because you first skip breakfast. And chronic short sleep is associated with all kinds of chronic diseases, starting with obesity, diabetes type 2, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And the background of all these interactions are both genetic, environmental, behavioral, and biological. But it's not funny to sleep short and late on a chronic basis. That's what I want to explain to you, because these chronic disorders, physical disorders, based on chronic jet lag, are the consequences. 
Next, please. So I think it may work like this. When, you're, when you have ADHD, you have a higher chance of getting obese, getting winter depression or SAD, seasonal affective disorder. Seasonal affective disorder goes with carbohydrate craving in winter and goes with late sleep. And late sleep goes with short sleep. And short sleep uh, induces in an altered leptin ghrelin ratio, your appetite and satiety hormones. And this also leads to carbohydrate craving. So there is where the obesity may come from, from short sleep, from late sleep, and from winter depression. So the, the physical and the mental part perfectly work together to make you obese in the end. Skipping breakfast is also one factor that leads to binge eating in the afternoon. And when you binge in the afternoon, you usually don't binge salads. But uh, carbohydrate and fatty stuff leading to obesity. When you're obese, you develop inflammation and inflammation may be the, um, the factor that leads to all those diseases that are here to the left. Next. It's even been shown already in 2009 that the severity of ADHD predicts your weight and binge eating. So when you, when you follow the, the uh, the lower axis to the right, the ADHD index, the higher the ADHD index is, the higher the chance of obesity and binge eating. So there is a relationship between severity and weight. Next. Yes, ADHD is more often obese, not only in adults, but also in children. And the BMI, the body mass index, is 70% uh, increase in adults with ADHD and 40% in children and is after controlling for confounding factors like mood, age, gender and so on. And now that it's about uh, weight and uh, eating, uh, I have some clients who overcompensate their having ADHD, their fear of eating too much and then they get in uh, to be underweight. Do yeah. you recognize that, that some are overcompensating because they are afraid to get into binge eating and obesity, yeah. etc.? Yeah, well, the most people uh, have overweight, That the most, most people that I see, some people are underweight or even anorexic. Those yeah. people want to control um, yeah. their, their impulsiveness, their need for food, and in fact, they, yeah. eat, they eat because of sleep loss. Yeah. And that's, yeah. that's why you can't control it. So yeah. you cannot lose weight when you sleep too short. Yeah. You better sleep first better and then start a diet and treat your ADHD with medication and then start a diet. That will work. Yeah, but yeah. not when you have to do it all on yourself and climb a hill that's too steep. Yeah. Uh, because you work against biology. Mm -hmm. Thank Next. You. Yeah, we, we were worried about uh, the physical health of people with ADHD. So we, we made a questionnaire and we compared around 200 people with ADHD with 200 control people. And we found not only that ADHD people were more often depressed and stressed and burned out and tired, but also they had more pulmonary problems, cardiovascular problems, gastrointestinal problems, metabolic problems, immun immunological problems and skeletal problems. So everything was increased and this was significantly increased in 200 people with ADHD compared to the control group of the similar amount. So this was impressive and this is why I say jet lag is bad for the body on a chronic basis and this is also what we know from people from flight attendants from stewards that fly over time zones for a long period of time. They develop more disease, they die younger because living out of phase, being desynchronized with time, is very unhealthy in the long term. We know this from night shift workers as well. So people with ADHD may not work in night shifts, but they live as if they work in night shifts. And that's, that's where the problem, I think, starts. That it's chronic, it's not temporary, it's not for a short period of time. It's your biology driving you to sleep late, sleep short, and develop this jet lag physically. So the link between ADHD and these mostly physical problems and, and depression, etc., is through sleep. 
Yeah. That's the link between ADSD and the problems you mentioned. Well, this is our hypothesis that we try to to uh, confirm in all our studies, actually. Yeah. yeah. Let, let's continue. Now, what about melatonin? Melatonin is a sleep hormone. And there, there are many rumors about melatonin that it's, it's not helping everybody, that it's maybe even dangerous. And uh, while well, one thing is for sure, you need to know how to use it, which dose and what time, because it's not a sleep aid as such, it's a clock aid. It resets your clock based on the timing. So a fixed time is very, very important and a fixed dose as well for the right effect. But melatonin has been shown to be an antioxidant. It's related to the metabolic system and it inhibits cancer growth. So it's very beneficial when you sleep enough to have uh, an appropriate level of melatonin in your blood and in your brain in order to inhibit cancer growth. Because when we sleep, cancer development is inhibited as a rule. But when we sleep too short, we don't have the time to do it properly. And these melatonin levels may be too low or too short. We are too short exposed to melatonin. So this is, this is the idea that sleeping short may also lead to um, shorter protection by melatonin. And here you see a paper that was a wake up call for me, melatonin, an, inhi an inhibitor of breast cancer. Um, it, it, it's, it would be incredible if this were true, but I can tell you since 2015, there have been many, many studies showing the same, that melatonin, when used at night, so not during daytime, at the appropriate time, at appropriate dose, may protect against cancer. And um, melatonin is now added to chemotherapy for all kinds of uh, cancers, uh, showing um, beneficial effects and increased effects of chemotherapy and also reduced side effects of chemotherapy. So it's very interesting to study that on PubMed, if you like. Um, so this could explain why people with uh, uh, less protection by melatonin in the long term may develop more cancer, such as people working in night shifts for 20, 30 years, like now nurses. They develop more breast cancer after 20, 30 years. So not after one year, not after 10 years, but after a really long time of night shifts and we, we suppose uh, less protection by melatonin. So this is my argument that in ADHD, whether you work in night shifts or not, you live as if you work in night shifts, having the same, maybe having the same risk as people working that are long time in night shifts. Next, now please. That you mention, now that you mentioned long-term uh, bad sleep, there's a question about it. Uh, can I repair my sleep biorhythm after more than 10 years of horrible sleep? So before you start with all the possible interventions. Yes. Is, is, is it possible after 10 or 20 years when you are yes. an adult, etc.? Yes. Can you change? Well, it, of course, it depends on the cause for this horrible sleep. And during 10 years is a very long time. And I can imagine you don't believe it can change anymore. But um, when there is the right um, assessment of sleep disorder, so whether it's late sleep or insomnia or a combination or sleep apnea, this is necessary to give you the right proper treatment. But I can tell you that I regularly treat people who have been sleeping horrible for years and that I simply treat them for with chronotherapy and they improve and they can sleep. Okay. So there's hope, definitely. There's hope. Okay. But <laughs> you, you really need to know what to do and your, your, your physician needs to do to know what to do. And it's even better if you know what to do and teach them because the, the science on sleep is new and relatively, um, it's not everywhere known. For me, it's new. So we're learning every day. So don't complain if your GP isn't aware yet, but find all the, all the information you can use and use this as well, if you can. That's what this evening is all about. So go ahead. Right, right. Next, please. Yeah, there is, so there's a circle between uh, little sleep, irritable mood, eating too much, obesity, and ADHD, and then it starts again. So this is one cycle of unhealthy 
consequences, starting with the sleep. I, I already explained this, I think. Next one. Yeah, then about skipping breakfast. My patients almost never have breakfast. They have breakfast at 11 a.m., consisting of coffee and a cigarette. Uh, and I beg your pardon, but that's no breakfast. That's twice dopamine. Coffee and cigarettes work on the dopamine system and you better take medication for ADHD because it's healthier than <laughs> especially nicotine. Yeah. So what do they tell me? Oh, doctor, I can't have breakfast because my, my stomach is not ready for food. It, full, it feels as if I eat a stone and I can't digest it yet. I may digest it later in the morning or even in the afternoon. But skipping breakfast on itself is associated with overweight and binge eating. And 80% of people with ADHD binge. I asked them. Um, I lost the slides, uh, Viljo. Yep. And <laughs> not sure what happened. Let's fix that. I'm not sure that I can do it by heart completely. That's okay. That's okay. I we'll get that back. <laughs> So, oh yeah. There we go. Thank you. So, when you binge, um, you may suffer from weight changes in adult life, and this is indeed. I asked if my patients they, their weight changes ten to twenty kilograms from eighteen years on, and it's normally zero to five in the not in the general population. So, this is also more extreme. These weight changes, and this has to do with the binging and then dieting again, and then binging again and losing control and so on. And I think it's it's very important to understand that losing weight is very hard, even not possible when you are in sleep debt. So first things first. Next. Then the treatment, the treatment of late sleep starts with sleep hygiene, followed by melatonin in the evening and light therapy in the morning. And this is not that we can pick one of them. It always starts with sleep hygiene but it has to be followed by melatonin and or light therapy. Otherwise, it's way too hard to achieve results. Because for a person with ADHD, sleep hygiene is very difficult. You, you are a late person. You have to act against your nature without any biological aid. You need this biological aid, melatonin and light. Next, please. So I, I'll talk you through the sleep hygiene. It's not unimportant, but it's, it's very hard when you don't use the other two. Sleep hygiene means that you make your day as bright as possible and your night as dark as possible. That's why the contrast is here indicated in the picture. So if you don't want to be exposed to light at night, limit your toilet visits at night by drinking nothing after 8 p.m. And when you have to go to the toilet, limit light or use no light and block in your bedroom all light sources, use blinded curtains, so no luxoflex, which will let through all light of the environment and uh, artificial lighting at night or sun in the morning, in the, in the summer, early in the morning. Blinded curtains make it really dark. Wear an eye mask if you don't have blinded curtains, a good one that really stops light entering the eyes because even through closed eyelids, the light reaches the retina and the brain. That's how we're made. It will wake up on its light. Limit the light of charges, timers, mobile phones that wake you up at night. Take care of that. Use no screens after 9.30. That's early. So we found a trick. Use orange goggles. This one to the left. From 7 p.m. that inhibits the blue light from mobile phone, iPads, television to enter your retina and reach the clock. Because when the light from the screens enter the brain, you are waking up and your melatonin onset is even more delayed. When you use the orange goggles, your brain perceives the environment as dark, thereby initiating melatonin production earlier. Your own melatonin will advance. And this is the most more natural way to, to increase your melatonin level on time. Next, please. What, you, what else can you do? You can take a hot shower at night, not in the morning, because it helps with the melatonin um, uh, onset. Wake up at the same time every day, also in weekends. Well, that's hard when you are sleep deprived. I know, 
but it will help you to stay out of jet lag. Because when you sleep in on Saturday, Sunday, and you make it really late and you have to advance your rhythm on Monday, it will take up till Thursday until you're really synchronized again. And then you have only two days, Thursday and Friday, that you're, on, that you're a bit less jet, jet lagged, they're feeling better physically, and then the weekend starts again. So what are you doing? You're not feeling well most of the week when you change your sleep onset time every weekend. Aim for a sleep duration of seven, eight hours and preferably between 11 p.m. and 7 a.m. I know it's difficult and you cannot do it only on your willpower. Most people can't, but you can do it with sleep aids like melatonin and light. Another one is no napping during daytime, longer than 30 minutes, because this goes in uh, uh, the sleep pressure that you need to fall asleep is diminished by every uh, minute of sleep longer than 30 minutes during daytime. Go outside in the morning, walk the dog to get the light into the eyes, even if you're oversensitive to light. Put off the sunglasses, otherwise you will never synchronize with the light of the day. Use you're light. Writing, uh, sorry, you're writing explicitly between 11 and 7 a.m. What's the, the range? C can it also be 12 to 8? And people sure. are... Sure, it's 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 just an indication, but it it means that it's has it's related to the light and dark cycle. It's not it's not an uh, imperative uh, or a rule that you should live up to, but it has to do with synchronization with dark and light cycles. Yeah, and of course, in summer it's a bit different from in winter, but uh, I, this is a kind of a mean, a kind yeah, of. Yeah. A, but uh, some people were were a bit well. Uh, protesting I well, understand. Do, we, do we have to adapt to society or will self society adapt to us and can i yeah. start my work at 10 o'clock in the morning instead of yeah. at eight sure but there, uh, what's the what's the bandwidth yeah i understand but you know it's not about society it's about natural rhythms of ourselves and of the world that are out of sync and we can protest against that the rhythm of the world is different from our natural rhythm but then we will suffer from all these kinds of complaints. And if we want to change that, uh, it would be it would be great if you could achieve something that looks like this rhythm. Uh, I don't want to yeah. say you have to be from 11. Yeah, no, no. Well, yeah. that, that's of course, it's not, never true, but strive for something in this region. Yeah. Um, limited use of sunglasses during daytime, even when you're oversensitive to light. Uh, in my experience, people can, can get used to light um, uh, when they try. And we're still finding out what's, what's happening in the eye, in the receptors of the eye, leading to oversensitivity. So we'll, we'll tell you when we find out. But make it light during daytime for your brain and make it dark for the brain at nighttime. That's the essentials of sleep hygiene. Next, please. Then melatonin. How do we use it properly? Don't use melatonin for sleep apnea, for insomnia, for restless legs. It won't work. It works perfectly well for late sleep on a chronic basis. Um, when we use one to three milligrams, this is already a high dose, uh, use it around 10 p.m. Not at 10 p.m., around 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be more polite, uh, using a timer preferably to remind you um, and then um, try to make a ritual for going to bed and reducing light and uh, taking the hot shower and, and cooling down, let's say, and not starting all kinds of projects losing artificial light. When you have to use these orange goggles to protect your brain from waking up. Um, this is a high dose, I said, we have been studying the lower dose of 0.5 milligram earlier in the evening, but it's quite complicated to, to tell an audience of 1000 people in a minute. So I, I choose to give this more easy um, um, way of using melatonin with a high dose. Start with one, if it's not enough after a week, increase to two or three milligram. But take care when you're sleeping during daytime, the dose may be too high and you should reduce, not increase it. 
So it, it can ha generate a hangover. So take care. Some people take 10 milligrams, but that's really not, not helpful. That's, that's overdosing. Can you do this without a doctor? This, uh, because uh, Yes, you because you can buy it house. online everywhere. Yeah. But take care that you don't buy stuff with all kinds of additional stuff like magnesium or valdespair or whatever they, they combine. Uh, take care that it's only melatonin in the right dose. And this is a short acting melatonin that I'm uh, describing here, the one to three milligrams. It works only three to four hours. So it helps you to fall asleep earlier. It sets the clock. Um, but when you wake up after short acting melatonin at 3 a.m. and you lay awake for one or two hours again, use long acting melatonin. In our country, it's called Circadin. It's registered for people above 55 who usually have uh, less deep sleep and wake up at the same time. And this is helpful also for people with ADHD that wake up after they, they slept using uh, this dose of melatonin first. Oh, not, not Anyways, it, 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 it's not a problem to ask your GP, hey, uh, you know, I have ADHD, can you help me with uh, melatonin or mm. uh, and, and then come up with this advice of you? That's, I think it's, uh, it's safer to talk to your GP, isn't it? Um, it, it might be, but if they're, they're not aware, what should you do? <laughs> Ah, okay. yeah. Sandra, we have we have a quick question that I just want to get the right information on about the influence of magnesium on sleep. And just for those in the UK as well, Circadian is the same one, is the same brand of magnesium available here. Um, I'm not aware that magnesium is helpful for sleep. It's maybe helpful for restless legs and for joint and muscle pains and other stuff. Um, but uh, circadin doesn't contain magnesium, as far as I know. And I'm, I'm not sure whether circadin is available in the UK. You can find out yourself, I think. Oh, sorry, that was me saying, yes, circadin is, is available in the UK. Okay. That's, that's our brand. Wonderful, yeah. But it's registered for older people. Um, but I, I give it to people who wake up after short-acting melatonin uh, is not sufficient, after three, four hours. But it's on prescription. But you can also buy it online, not circadin, but long acting melatonin. Um, yeah, it's what it is. <laughs> it's not yeah. an ideal world. No. Yeah. Next, please. Then the light therapy. Uh, light therapy consists typically of bright white or blue light. It's the blue wavelength in white light that does the job that wakes you up in the morning. So don't use it at night because it wakes you up. Use it in the early morning, preferably between seven and eight in the morning. Uh, around. <laughs> 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 okay. So what is the uh, what is the um, the amount of light? It's it's ten thousand lux. This is, for instance, the the lamp on the right uh, produces ten thousand lux, but it's important that it's at 20 centimeters from the eye and that means that it's very close and that you can even read a book and that you have to lean forward to the lamp in order to have this 20 centimeters because when you lean back it's 40 and when it's 40 centimeters you have to stay there twice as long because, because it's the dose is time times intensity the 10,000 lux times distance so this has all been studied, has been proven. So there's also this little one, the Philips Energy Light with the blue light, also equivalent to 10,000 lux. But this is a very tiny lamp that's easy for traveling, but you have to hang over on it to get the right intensity into your very eyes. So people usually won't know that and won't do that properly. So they won't get sufficient light intensity on their retina. Therefore, and also because it's so hard to sit 30 minutes daily for one to three weeks every morning between seven and eight when it's breakfast time and the kids go to school, when you have to hurry because you're always late and so on, people don't comply to this, this difficult regimen usually. So the, the, the glasses are, are a new invention that, that guarantee at least that the distance is okay because it's very close to the eyes. The intensity is much lower 
because the, the, the distance is so, so close. Uh, and it's blue light. Uh, this is this one, the Propeak light glasses. This is the one we use. Uh, that we have experience with. And this one also has the orange glasses that you can uh, put in yourself. You can change the glasses yourself for the evening protection from 7 p.m., around 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah. Well, the wake-up light that many people get for Christmas because they have difficulty waking up in the winter when it's so dark is not effective enough for ADHD people to improve mood or to reset the late sleep. It's not, the intensity is not right. So that's why I put a cross uh, uh, over the wake up light. There's much more to learn about the rhythm and what you can do about it here are some sources, uh, if you like. Next, please. Then is chronotherapy for sleep for late sleep, able to reduce ADHD symptoms severity? That's the question. Can you click, please, Filio? There's this one study that corrected the late sleep phase with bright light in the morning. And by doing that, ADHD symptoms indeed improved. This was only a pilot study from three years ago. And the next one, please click, Filio is our study that was recently published. We used melatonin, the low dose melatonin in the early evening. And this also uh, changed the, the melatonin onset and it uh, improved ADHD symptoms. So this is, uh, this is um, promising, I would say. And if this is true for ADHD, it might be true for other disorders as well because in psychiatry, almost every disorder comes with sleep loss and sleep problems. So maybe we should not think that uh, sleep problems are the result of depression or bipolar or ADHD, but maybe the sleep is the starting point for all disorders and is sleep loss the mother of psychiatry? That's what I tend to think after all these years of studying. Um, so sleep is so important for mental but and physical health that we cannot overdo it. We have to we have to understand what's what helps us and what's beneficial and what's making it worse. Can I have next, please? Oh yeah, this is not about sleep, but it's about COVID that I want to share with you this important new knowledge. Can I have next? There are new studies showing that ADHD people have an increased risk for COVID, which is very worrying to me. And I hope, I think to every one of you, this is an Australian study published last year showing that in untreated people with ADHD compared to non ADHD people, the risk for COVID was highly increased. And this was diminished when the people with ADHD were treated with medication. How come? Does medication treat COVID, Pre prevent COVID? No, we don't think so. We think, can I have next please, Avilio, that people with ADHD who are not treated may forget the social distancing rules that we all have to comply to now, that they have difficulty to deal with masks. We can see that in office. Or maybe there's also a more biological immunological problem. And the medical treatment for ADHD reduces the risk of getting infected. That's at least something we can consider. We can, we can strive for to get it on time before we develop this severe uh, unwanted viral infection. Next, please. This is another study from this year and showing in a very large population study that ADHD has a five-fold increased risk of COVID again but it, we are not alone. Bipolar and depression and schizophrenia also have an increased risk. But let's talk about ADHD. And this was after adjusting for obesity and other risk factors that are also associated with an increased risk. Next, please. Now about vitamin D. What has vitamin D to do with all this? Well, vitamin D comes to us through sunlight, not through the eyes this time, but through the skin. But when we use factor 50, it won't reach us. You can also eat a lot of fatty fish, but nobody does it on a daily basis. And the result is that 
all the half of the population suffers from low vitamin D, but especially people with mental health problems, including ADHD people. When you have a low vitamin D, you're tired, have low energy and all kinds of complaints that you can read. Uh, and you have a higher risk when you have a mental health problem, ADHD, a dark skin, are an older person, are overweight or obese, and so on. Here you see the right dose for daily adjustment, 800 to 4,000 international units a day. And when you're really deficient, and you can measure this in, in blood, uh, you use 50,000 international units in a, in a small um, um, fluid. But now here it comes. Vitamin D3 is proven effective against viral pulmonary infection. And this could also play a role in the increased risk for COVID in ADHD people because they have been shown to have low levels of vitamin D. Next, please. So this study also <laughs> drew my attention because this was a hypothesis, but now this has been published that vitamin D has a role in preventing COVID infection progression and severity. Next, please. Here, this is a study that is, uh, that's been talked about a lot, but also criticized because it went, it measured the mean vitamin D levels in 20 countries of the population in general and uh, uh, associated this with the chance of getting COVID. So to the left, you see the number of cases per million people in the population and below on the uh, X, X, S, X, you see the mean concentration of vitamin D. And you see that the higher the level of vitamin D to the right, the lower the chance of getting infected. And this is significant. This is a very rough measure, a mean population level of vitamin D it says nothing about individuals. And it is only the ones that were measured and we, and so on and so on. But um, it, it was not correlated with uh, the number of deaths and the number of hospital admissions by COVID. So it, is, it seems that vitamin D is not preventing death or severity, but it's preventing getting it in the first place. So that's why I think it would be wise for all of us to consider taking vitamin D when we know we're low and taking not a low dose, but an appropriate dose and or measure our vitamin D levels when we do need to know. But all people with dark skin, all people with ADHD <laughs> and all elderly should use it now, yep. not yesterday, tomorrow, immediately. I do it yep. myself because uh, I think we are in need of any protection that can help us from COVID. Yeah, sure. I'm not elderly, but I do use extra vitamin D, vitamin D, sure. Great. And, and which dose, Hans? Sorry, no, no. Ah. I can get it from the, from the kitchen where it is. Oh, no, it's so, here. No, so it's here in my... It's my morning ritual. It is yes. my medication and there is vitamin D. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's thousand international units. That's okay. Yeah. Okay, That's thank right. you. So, so don't so don't use a, a multivitamin preparation because usually the dosages are too low in those combined uh, uh, um, preparations. So you should stick to the right dose. And I, yeah. I put it on the slide before. I think we are almost at the end. Yeah, so we have the next question, slide. a few questions left, but uh, okay. Yeah, when you want more information, here's my book um, in English. Um, I, I intend to make more webinars and podcasts uh, through the Superbrains app that we developed for digital treatment of ADHD and blended treatment. Uh, it's still a Dutch website, but it will be in English in the near future. Um, and the next one. Take care. Yeah. Do, do you have some energy left for a few last questions? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, one is about, uh, I think it's a professional that asked this, um, which screening questionnaires are usable for sleeping problems in ADHD? Are there special screening questionnaires? Yeah. Yeah, we use the uh, Holland Sleep Disorder Questionnaire the HSDQ, okay. you can find it online. 
it's a okay. uh, validated scale um, and it's um, it covers all sleep disorders actually oh, um, good. Good. yeah and it's not making a diagnosis but it's giving an indication where you have to look for as a physician or a psychologist when people fill in the questionnaire we have a starting point yeah yeah very important because I've had some training of a sleep sleep neurologist and he also said always also check sleep yeah with your client so yes. that's very important yeah yes um, then there was another question is there a difference in sleeping problems sleeping patterns between the ADHD types ADD ADHD XYZ subtypes yes I mentioned it already shortly ADHD people sleep, sleep short and late and ADD people usually sleep longer and earlier but are still mm -hmm. tired during daytime yeah so they are definitely not that late as compared to ADHD people and that's why I think that hyperactivity may be an adjustment to sleep loss to stay to keep awake because as long as you move or talk you cannot fall asleep but as soon as you sit down and relax, you may fall asleep during daytime because you're exhausted. Yeah. Yeah. So hyperactivity may have a function in keeping you awake because of this chronic sleep loss that you're suffering from. Yes, I know from my clients as well as from myself that I've been fighting so much against sleep during school time, you know, the professor yeah. keeps on talking. Oh, boring. Oh, my God. Yeah. Not today, not today. You were excellent. You kept me awake. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, then, uh, yeah, what you use uh, in the night or afternoon, uh, like coffee, don't use coffee, of course, I suppose. But tea was a question. Green tea, black tea, white tea. Well, I have that same question. Yeah, it's, it's difficult to tell you what's best for everyone because I think it may differ. Uh, it may be individual. Your sensitivity to coffee may be very different. Uh, I can sleep on a, on an espresso at 11 p.m. I, I don't have any problem with coffee. I don't know why. Other people shouldn't do it after 2, 2 p.m. because they, they never sleep. So listen to your body that, that yeah. can tell you perfectly what's good for you and what's not. And yeah. whether it's black or green tea, I, I have no idea what to advise uh, in general. I, I just yeah. don't know. But since we're talking adults and when you get a bit older, then most people I know skip coffee and throw black tea away, use green tea or something else. And uh, Well, that's that's perfect if it helps. Yeah, mostly as a standard. Anyways. Yeah. Um, then was some a question about sports. Yeah. Is there a sort of ideal time to do sports because yeah. sport activates you? So it shouldn't do at 10 p.m., of course, but is right. there an ideal time for that? Yes, there's a time for everything and also for sports that has been studied. Uh, the ideal time is between 4 and 7 p.m. So okay. early in the evening, not late at night, indeed, because it, you're aroused, you arouse your system too much. But between 4 and 7, it may induce earlier onset of melatonin. Aha, uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Great, thank you. Um, the wake-up light you already mentioned. The wake up light is very interesting, but it's only a gadget. It doesn't work for ADHD. Mm -hmm. um, are there any medications? That, that was a question and it brought me to uh, atomoxetine, Stratera. Mm -hmm. uh, which medications for ADD can be taken in the evening and or before the night? Uh, apart from melatonin, mm -hmm. the real ADSE medication, as we know, Statera works 24-7. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any knowledge about medications? You mean, during the night you... you mean the stimulants? Well, stimulants the non-stimulants. The non-stimulants. That's what I thought, or other medications that can be taken yeah. before the night. Well, it's again a, a mixed answer. Um, Regarding the stimulants, they are usually taken early in the morning because they are just like sunlight. They wake you up, they make you alert, they make you focused. And it shouldn't be used at night because then your dopamine should go down. But as the medication usually wears off uh, before bedtime or at the end of the afternoon, whatever, uh, it, the rebound that, that comes after the medication wearing off may also keep you awake. For some people, it has been shown that a low dose of Ritalin, short-acting stimulant, 
may help to fall asleep. This is very strange because we all know that stimulants keep you awake because they wake you up. But when you suffer from the rebound from the medication wearing off at that specific time when you want to go to bed, it may help some people, not all. It's again different and depending on your sensitivity yeah. to, the, to the stuff. But since we use melatonin, I seldomly need to give Ritalin in the evening so uh, as a sleep aid. So melatonin does the trick better, I would say. Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe th th your answer inspires me because tomorrow, for the Dutch people uh, to know, tomorrow uh, I will have a webinar with Dr. Rob Pereira. It will be in Dutch, so for the Dutch people, about mm -hmm. ADHD and medication. So yeah. you can still uh, go and uh, register for that. But I imagine my clients or other pa patients going to doctors and Many doctors don't know enough about ADHD, let alone about this specific sleep thing or medication, etc. Mm -hmm. So I would challenge them to write, to ask their doctor to, to be open and to write his or her question to us. So it's good that professionals approach us with questions because sometimes the patient, him or herself, doesn't really know what to ask for. But if you notice your doctor doesn't know, okay, no problem, but then please contact and they can use my email address or Impulse and Wordblind or ADHD Europe. We will sort it out because you, you tell a lot of very good things, uh, Sandra. And I know uh, doctors that are very good, well, well informed, doctors that know you, did your colleges, etc. But there are enough who are not very well informed yet. So we are working on that, aren't we? I'm working with you because. Um... Uh, my aim is to make online education available to the world. So to patients, but also to professionals, so that they all have the same information, and yeah. they can, that they can access that information online. And nowadays, everything is online. So why not dedicated courses to sleep and ADHD and whatever? Um, and I'll keep you updated when it's ready and where people can find it. Yeah. And for the Dutch people, I can tell we have made a protocol how to treat different sleep problems for professionals in ADHD. And I, I can I, I think I send it to you and people may may use it for the Netherlands, uh, for the Netherlands uh, people that are in sleep tonight. So we can freely distribute that already in Dutch. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So quest we are you can send us questions via email and I will forward it to Sandra Coy or will answer it, especially when you're a professional. We really want to help everybody to share the knowledge that is already for use for everybody, aren't we? Yeah, but I'm not sure I can answer all the questions no, of no, no. a thousand people. I'm a bit afraid when you say that. No, 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 no. <laughs> no we'll work on it in, okay. in, in okay. due time. We di I didn't promise we answer immediately. No. <laughs> Maybe it's this year somewhere. <laughs> Anyways, um, let's uh, close and uh, let me end with uh, Filio. Can before, you come in? Uh, oh. Before we close, I, I'm here. I'm just, my camera's off. Hang on. Oh. Hello. Hello. Uh, I will I will post our email address in chat so that people can access that and can send yep. us emails. Yeah. Um, before we close, I'm just trying to confirm um, we've received over 30 donations since the start of the webinar. So I just want to say thank you to all of you. Uh, we've had we've had about 600 people watching simultaneously, which is really, really good. And, you know, your donations help us with these webinars, increasing our quality, making sure we can, you know, contribute to our speakers for giving up their time and the like. Okay. Great. That's it from me, Hans. Yeah, I'll feel you. Thank you very much for your excellent existence uh, today again and sandra thank you very much on behalf of the whole of europe that's a lot <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and some outside europe also united states canada etc so we are very happy yeah and hope to see you in a new webinar somewhere this year aren't we thank you so much for having me and i wish you all the best uh, organizing this wonderful webinars as adhd europe i think it's very very important thank you so much okay, okay. Thank bye you bye. and bye-bye everybody.